Hello and welcome back to Curiously Polar. My name is Chris. There's Mario. Hello. Hello, everybody. And, and of course, Hi, Chris. And of course, we talk about polar things, very north and very south. And uh, it is another uh, po <laughs> polar news. There is news. I mean, it's, it, it's interesting how much news there is and how much time we spend to f figure out what to put on the episode and whatnot. So, um, yeah, plenty of news there. Well, there's quite a quite a lot of news, and uh, actually, I think that uh, probably, I mean, you have also noticed down in Germany that uh, there is some sort of tension mounting between Russia. Oh yeah, that's we need to talk NATO about the Russians this, yeah. uh, doing things in the. Well, uh, how far is it in the Arctic? It is. It is. Not, is it in the Arctic or is it about the Arctic? What's going on right now? Well, it's actually going on all around. Uh, uh the russian areas uh, so uh, the um the russian fleet has one base in the west and that is or two bases in the west one in murmansk up in the kola peninsula or severomorsk which is uh, in the murman fjord and one in saint petersburg these are the two naval bases but of course the um the they, they have also a base in the east in the pacific and um and earlier in January, they have been uh, announcing the Russian Ministry uh, of uh, the Army or whatever it's called. I beg <laughs> forgiveness for not knowing what the ministry <laughs> that deals with the army in Russia is called um, uh, or the Navy. Uh, but uh, they have announced, like uh, they usually do, of course, uh, that they will do a, an exercise, a military exercise. And this time they are going to be doing a military exercise with all of the fleet at the same time. So they're going to be doing an exercise up in the west, so in the Arctic, in the Atlantic, in the Mediterranean, in the Black Sea and in the Pacific at the same time. That's a bit of and a here we have sizable exercise, I would think. That's a very sizable exercise. And uh, I don't know how many ships uh, are going around there, but there are about uh, 30 ships out, about, out of Murmansk. There are going to be some, uh, I think, five ships out of the Irish uh, Sea and then quite a lot of others. And, uh, and these are, uh, of course, I mean, as usual, uh, in the most cases, these things happen with the full knowledge of the, let's say, the opposing parties like NATO is warned and the Norwegian military is warned that these things are going to be happening. And so the Russians are staying in the international waters. But, uh, you know, the situation now is quite tense. And uh, we have up in Norway, we have news of uh, these five Russian ships that are mm. naval ships that are possibly accompanied by a submarine or two that are going down to the Irish Sea, but uh, they are outside of the of the Norwegian Sea. And uh, and then uh, you've seen that there are uh, surveillance uh, airplanes that are that are taking, uh, like they are observers, so right. they are observing, like the Russians do when NATO has their observation. And of course, like we know that as every year, NATO is going to be having an exercise, a Norwegian-led exercise up in Norway, which is uh, also something that uh, is, uh, of course, announced. It's uh, it's happening almost every year. It's a uh, Arctic training for NATO. But uh, when you read the, the news about what's... Uh, about the, let's say, tension around the, the Ukrainian situation, it's not very nice to to think about the military moving around and the exercise becoming like worldwide and, and very big. Hmm. So just uh, I just wanted to mention this because this is uh, taken a lot of the news the news up in Norway and uh, just about that. And then, of course, the other part of the news is that the Norwegian, you know that there are going to be the Winter Olympics now, don't you? Yes. Yeah, you do. So, uh, like, <laughs> they are going to be in China and they are, the Chinese have put these Winter Olympics uh, very close to the Gobi Desert. <laughs> so, in a place where usually it doesn't precipitate, I mean, there is not a lot of precipitation. There has been a, a lot of conflicts here in Norway I mean protests and things I mean you cannot have this and we have to send a lot of skis because the skis get worn uh, and we don't we cannot move the machines for tuning the skis because they get worn because of the sand from the desert that is going to be blown on the <laughs> on the slopes 
I mean, Norwegians take it very, very seriously, this thing with skiing. But you know what happened? No, you haven't you haven't followed this. It's not I, I haven't I don't highlight. really follow this, no. You don't? Oh no. my gosh, this is like even bigger than the Ukrainian, <laughs> Ukrainian it crisis here. It is so big that the practically like the majority, all of the champions, the Norwegian champions in all disciplines have got corona, including the trainers. The okay, coaches. Okay, yeah. So they are going to be delayed in coming to China because, of course, China has like any the strictest any rules right now. Yes. Strictest rules about moving. And this is just like, yeah, uh, the, two the different one, worlds the, and two the different kinds of worlds. The thing that made it on, on my radar, the, the latest thing sports related that uh, sports and COVID related that made it on my radar was the, uh, the, the tennis guy from Serbia. Ah, yeah. So um, you didn't you didn't uh, you didn't follow this uh, the the first British victory in alpine skiing? <laughs> I do not watch skiing. <laughs> no, not at all. Oh, not at all. Okay, well, <laughs> well, it all right. must be uh, some something. But uh, let's uh, stay uh, with our <laughs> with the theme here. How, I, how do we move? Digressions. How do we move from geopolitics and sports to beavers? That's my question. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But uh, in any case, it's uh, it's a nice change. Well, beavers, the uh, these cute and the majestic. I, I beaver. think cute. I, I actually think they are quite cute. Beavers have uh, like normally a reputation of living in the like temperate forests and building dams, and they are particularly known from Canada, and uh, but they are all over North America and mm -hmm. uh, actually in Europe they are making a, came, a comeback. Um, yes, in they are. The, uh, Denmark they have in Scotland and now in uh, in Northern Scandinavia are coming back and it's very nice. They are ecosystem engineers, so they modify the ecosystem. And uh, what do you associate with beavers usually? Oh, beaver dams, of course. A beaver dams, of course, yes, exactly. <laughs> and that's what they do. Beavers move further north in the Arctic and they build dams. Mm. They don't have the huge quantity of wood, but they do build dams with what they find and they are moving further and further north and they are moving over the permafrost soil. So we talked in the last episode about permafrost and the diminishing permafrost. Well, Beavers are ecosystem engineers that are actually helping him thawing the permafrost. And uh, it's uh, a totally new thing. There is uh, a, a very, very small group of researchers that have followed this, and they mostly followed by looking at uh, aerial pictures or satellite pictures of the tundra before and after uh, the entrance of the beavers. So you can actually identify the beaver dams in the permafrost and on the, in the tundra above the permafrost by looking at satellite pictures oh, really? and they found that there is a, a huge influx of beavers in the arctic so yeah in order to get the uh, in order okay let, let me let me try to 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 get a grip on that in order to well beavers can build dams anytime anywhere of course but of course they will not do this or it won't be there won't be any point in them doing it if there's no flowing water. So the th the permafrost is thawing that adds more water, and now the beavers come in because they have a new uh, ecosystem to move into. Is that about right? That's about right, and uh, especially they have uh, they have open access uh, to areas because uh, there is less ice and less snow on the ground, right. and so they can they can build these dams, and the water helps in actually thawing the permafrost. So they're actually improving the qualities of the ecosystem for their part because there is less ice and more water flowing and this is this is really good for them but uh it is becoming a, a problem because it accelerates a problem it is becoming an issue of concern because uh, they speed up the thawing of the permafrost oops one of the interesting uh interesting thing that i noticed is that um like uh, at aim up where i work we uh, assist with um, the uh, peer review of the arctic report card and uh, the arctic report card is a uh, 
is a, um, a document that is prepared by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the US, and it's the official state-of-the-Arctic uh, document, like a popular document, but it's written by scientists and is peer-reviewed, and, uh, and it's uh, released uh, just about in December every year. Now, this year, for the first time, there was one full essay, one full chapter of this Arctic report card, was about the beavers coming into the Arctic. So it is an emerging issue. The beavers have come to the Arctic and they are probably there to stay. Is that, okay, so so as you said, the beavers are ecosystem architects. They change things around mm. to make it more suitable for them. Uh, is that something to be worried about? I mean, is this a huge impact or is it just a tiny impact at this point? Well, uh, you know, uh, at the moment, there is a very little uh, done about beavers. I mean, very, very few studies have been done about beavers. So it's oh, like so we just don't just know one really. group done there. Okay. Because it is, uh, it is a, a huge territory. And uh, the study is done by looking at uh, the before and after pictures taken by satellites or aerial pictures of, of areas and, and looking at where new dams, new, new ponds have appeared that, shouldn't be there and then of course there is a ground truthing that is needed so you have to move into the field and see is this really a beaver dam so it's huge uh if you take the whole of arctic canada and alaska it's quite a quite a vast area right. to check so and, it, and it's happening mostly there there is no data about this happening um anywhere else for the moment but i'm sure that there there, there are going to be studies uh, coming soon about this but but the causal but, uh, it's... the causal connection could be the beavers <clears throat> um make dams they they add more water to certain parts and that in increases the speed of thawing for the permafrost that's that's the thing and uh, yeah. and then of course they are modifying the uh, the tundra and the tundra is also an ecosystem that is uh, harboring a lot of other live forms like uh, from the vegetation uh, mm -hmm. the vegetation that grows on the tundra uh, doesn't grow in in a lake <laughs> normally right. so uh, so they are going to be changing the uh, the vegetation there uh, on one side it could change the albedo so there is more reflection because of the water right but so it could be a good thing but um, nobody knows it's actually a relatively new phenomenon and uh, we're going to be seeing the effects of it um, or getting some results about studies on the effects of this uh, soon i hope right all right there, speaking of ice on land let's uh, speak on ice or of ice on the sea of ice on the sea and that is uh, i found this very nice uh, short uh, article about uh, the uh, Arctic sea ice. Uh, first of now, all, have, let, let, let yeah. me let me look at the website because you found this on polarbearsinternational.org. So the polar bears do have their yes. own website. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the polar bears international is a group that is uh, uh, mostly scientists uh, that uh, work with polar bears I see. that uh, do actually uh, divulgate. Uh, interesting things about polar bears and mm -hmm. uh, and they also have an education center and uh, it's um it's it's a it's a not a i mean it's it's a very interesting organization but that is a conservation organization but it's also um it's also an organization that uh, promotes education and science it's not just uh, conservation all right, and which uh, is a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, they uh, they finance uh, research or they uh, group uh, people that uh, they do work uh, about research, and uh, it's uh, like actually a, an old colleague of mine is working as a staff there is uh, Thea Bexoft from Denmark that is uh, working in in the group, and there is quite a lot of people. If you go on the website, you can see. Uh, you can have a lot of more information about what the Polar Bears International actually does. Uh, but uh, this article by Dave Bonan is a short article from uh, actually last year in September. But it's um, it's come to my my attention because I was looking at a very short, concise, and rigorous article about declining sea ice. 
and uh, and this is it this is really nice it, it will take you four minutes to read it and it's uh, popular so it's not com not obstruse it's not talking about uh, about the details of the climate models but uh, it uh, shows that uh, um, there is a decline in the Arctic sea ice and that has been started it's already been detected in 79 and uh, the area of the September ice, because they were talking about the minimum sea ice extent, so September is mean, usually the minimum sea ice extent, the surface covered by the sea ice, uh, has declined by about 50% since the start, since 79. And uh, the surface air temperatures, or the air close to the surface, has ri risen by about, well, actually a little more than 2 degrees, which is... Uh, three times as fast as the global average. As mm. we mentioned in the IPCC reports, uh, they said two, but it's actually two and something. And in AMAP, we've also had our climate report and it report about three per three times the the uh, the world average. So this is this. But uh, how fast are we going to get a summer ice-free Arctic? And, and that is something that people have been saying. Uh, I, I remember at the beginning of my career that people are saying like, well, at the end of the next century, so at the end of the of the, uh, of the 2100, more or less, uh, around 2100, we will have uh, 2100, we will have an Arctic sea uh, totally summer ice-free. But uh, this date is coming closer and closer. And... Uh, we are talking here, if you look at this picture, we are talking about uh, the different scenarios. These SSP something are the uh, the models. So you have the lines, the blue lines, for example, has an uncertainty that is represented by the shaded blue in the background. So you can see there are like quite a lot of uncertainty if you look at it, but it's, uh, uh, but it's actually, uh, this is about the sea ice extent, but it's actually, consistent with the decline into in the in the sea ice extent and, uh, the, and then the you uncertainty have the observations in band, black the uncertainty band pretty much gives you the 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 range from worst case to best case and uh, we're, when we're looking at yes. that we can still see an, a, a decline so the curve inside is definitely going to decline exactly so there are there are different stochastic there are different uh, um, when you, when you run a model for a particular year right. you have uh, you, you run it and you seed it and then you have a set of results and uh, and you run it several times and then you have an accumulation of results. Most right. of the results are what, are, well, the results are distributed for that year are distributed in a Gaussian form in a bell-shaped curve. Sure. So the top of the bell shape is where you get the, uh, the, uh, the line for that particular year. And then the tail of the, well, almost at the tail, almost all the way to the to the end, the ninety five percent interval is the top or the or the bottom of the of the uh, shaded area for that particular year. So it's less likely, and it gets less likely. It's not as likely that it will be on the line as it will be. Uh, if you're looking at the prediction, uh, and it will be uh, at the edge of the. Right of the um, of the shaded area, it's so, much so less the, likely. The probability yeah, so. is uh, is more likely that it's, it'll, it'll be yeah. at the top of that Gaussian curve. Yeah. Yeah. So if we if we sue the if we if we look at the um, if we follow this if we look at the observations, then you can see that the observations actually lie either on the the curves yes. or they go further down. And of course, the curves diverge as we get further away from the present time because of that's course. where the model has to predict things <laughs> and and the three models are quite different um but they are all uh, un well well known emission scenarios i'm, so, I'm quite yeah. used to this kind of a look at uh, future projections because of some uh, there there's a there's a local here in in the german area local weather forecast uh, company mm -hmm. that has the exact same format so they show they show you this um i, I find it interesting because they they, they show you this this curve being very, very, mm. or, or the probability space being very mm. thin, and then the further it goes out, the bigger it gets. And then, if you try to do weather forecast within oh. like two weeks, then you end up with a pretty 
big yeah. uncertainty, but but um, the, it still shows that the curve, the actual curve, is going to be somewhere in that range, of course. Yeah. Exactly, and that's uh, that's a, an extremely important concept to grasp. Yes. And I wish that that was into all curricula from like junior school because we, we should because probably that's, have that's essential <laughs> yeah we should probably have mentioned at the beginning um of this part of the show that it would be beneficial to watch instead of just listen <laughs> no exactly sorry about it's this. difficult to convey anyways, these concepts yeah. just in words yeah. but um yeah okay yeah. Exactly. But um, in any case, like here we have these decline, declining curves. So they start high at the left of the graph and they go right. low. I'm noticed that I'm trying to explain <laughs> this, uh, this graph and, uh, and it's coming down. And the, uh, the bottom line here is that uh, uh, if we look at the latest uh, studies, they say, well, it's not going to be at the end of the century. It's going to be earlier by 2036 or 2056 that's so like 70 to years 60 years. to 70 years too early yes exactly and uh, that is uh quite quite soon you know you know that <laughs> we, is we have a chance of seeing that and you, seeing you know what, for, what for some for some reason this reminds me of some of those covid proje projections where people just seem to be incapable of uh, of thinking in exponential terms and they try to mm. linearly ex expo extrapolate yeah. things into the future and then it turns out no it's not linear it's nope. moving in a very <laughs> different trajectory <Yes. laughs> no mm -hmm. exactly so we are we are getting uh, we are getting we are getting quite uh, quite close to uh, to an ice free arctic and uh, and this i mean how about this for polar bears well Polar bears are not uh, happy with the diminishing sea ice. They're going to be forced to be uh, on land because, uh, like, uh, yeah, they can swim, but they are not uh, marine mammals in the sense uh, of a whale. So they they have to go on land every now and then, and to be close to land, especially in the summer. Uh, walruses as well are actually I can throw it in uh, they will not like this <laughs> but, but you know um, who will like this yeah. those who ship goods from west to east and east to west yeah there's uh, those and, and not only uh, and um, maybe we should have this in the next episode something about uh, like uh, activities in the uh, in the uh, in the Arctic basin oh, sure. Sure. and the industrial activities not just not just transport we're talking about fishing we got to deep sea mining and like there is quite a lot that uh, that can happen and uh, yeah let's uh, let's get in the next episode <laughs> yeah so but, next uh, next yeah. up on the list let's let's move on to the next topic which um i'm i'm sorry there's <laughs> it's not a super happy topic but it's one that we've we've uh, watched a while and uh mm -hmm. it's about plastics and nanoplastics in yeah. the arctic so what's yes, this one about this is a study, uh, a very recent study, because uh, it actually uh, it will be published on, on paper in May 2022. So it's uh, fresh off the preprint. Um, and uh, it's about uh, nanoplastic. Now, nanoplastic, you, you have different forms of plastic pollution. And, uh, and we have small fragments of plastic that are into the ecosystem this, this we know i mean we have come to know what uh, what they all what they all are and uh, and then we have microplastics which are, are about to be in one micrometer or micrometer and uh, five millimeters in mm -hmm. size so this is like small plastic but still a five millimeter piece of plastic you you see it and uh, and if we go between one micrometer if we go below that then we call it nanoplastics these are plastics that are so small that uh, they in some cases they have been shown to pass through for example the digestive system and into the bodies of uh, of uh, um, crustaceans for example uh, in the sea so we are talking about uh, quite difficult uh, particles to filter out now Studying this sort of very small plastic is not easy because when you are sampling, 
the ice. And here we're talking about people that have been sampling the ice. You see on the picture that uh, there is a dot over Greenland and a dot over uh, West Antarctica. Uh, I think it's uh, McMurdo. So these are two different there. sampling sites where they, where they dug out sites. snow pretty much. Yeah. So they have uh, dug out, dug out uh, snow uh, fern, so on top of the inland ice in, in Greenland, and then they have looked at uh, sea ice in a uh, core of sea ice in uh, in the uh, in Antarctica. And then they analyzed what kind of plastics are in there. And then they looked at a very very small plastic and seeing what kind of plastic is more prevalent in these areas, and uh, and also like. It is very important to when you're sampling all these things that you, and when you do the analysis that you stay away from or, or that you test for any contaminations that you might have for plastics that you yourself are using ah, during you, the sampling. You, you, you might be right. wearing a fleece jacket or something, and that might, you might contribute a uh, to yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. you may use uh, you may use the, a pipette with a with a plastic. Oh, tip, and of course, for example, we, we talked about the, the the color of ships rubbing off when it comes to exactly. contact with ice and these kind of things. Yeah. So this this study, I mean, it is a scientific article. It's uh, f downloadable by just about anybody, I think. Uh, and uh, so you can read it. It's uh, it's very difficult if you are not used to uh, to scientific articles to follow this. But uh, at least the the abstract at the beginning and the conclusion and the introduction are quite good. But these th these uh, researchers have looked at very very much at uh, like uh, how do you call it as be making sure that they didn't contaminate the. Uh, the particles and then they have looked at uh, uh they have used uh, something called a thermal desorption you know like a, a kind of a it's, it's called a, a thermal desorption proton transfer reaction mass spectrometry so it's it's, it's a, a spectroscope it's an instrument a mass it's a mass spectrometer yeah. that looks at with it with a special particular uh, technique to nanoplastic of different types because you want to know what kind of plastic you are actually using and of course there is a polyethylene so pe which is uh, quite uh, quite which is uh, one of the good, widest uh, uses used plastics uh, these days yeah anyway. and it's and it's one that we have i don't know i mean it's probably isn't it polyethylene these like a, a bottle uh, i'm looking Maybe. around here here's a like here's this. a anyways yeah. here's a battery holder that's made from pe yeah. uh but bottles yeah. milk milk so, milk bottles and things like that are often made yeah from PE. so you have yeah. it's it's quite inert and it's made from ethanol so it's uh, actually quite a quite an interesting product and very uh very widely used then you have polypropylene um and uh, uh then you have uh that's a pp uh, then you have polyethylene tereftalate, or what is called PET, PET. That's also Coke some bottles. bottles. The one, that, Coke the one bottles, that are yeah. like a soft. And then you have polystyrene or styrofoam, like PS, and uh, polyvinyl chloride, which is PVC. That is uh, not very good for human health because of the uh, chlorine uh, uh, um, connections or bonds, and, and then you have especially also if you if you burn PVC, it uh, it it becomes even more yeah. uh, dangerous, even, even yes. more noxious for for humans. And then you have also another kind of microplastic that people have looked in this study, and that is uh, the nanoparticles from tire wear, so from rubber. automotive tires, and sort of, so yeah. rubber plastics uh, that uh, rubber rubber particles that are. Um, that are being uh, that are being uh, diffused, and they found. And if you look at uh, the picture there, and uh, I mean the first picture in the article, I don't know if you can can show it. Like you have Greenland, and you can see that they were really. Uh, it wasn't this one here that I was thinking about. It was uh, uh, the picture, the figure, figure one, uh, further there, down. There's or, no. Oh, you have one. it there, bro. Figure one. See. Yeah. Um, oh, here, just, yes, yes. Yeah, yes, that yes, one yes. there, just to show you where it is. So you you have Greenland in the picture above, in the figure above, and it's like on the top of the inland ice. And then in the um, in the uh, aerial pictures below, you have a picture of Mamurdo Sound. Uh, so by the Ross Ice Shelf in Antarctica, and the location of this uh, um, uh, sampling site in the sea uh, in Antarctica, and. What they found out actually here is that nanoplastics are everywhere. So they have been found out there. But in Greenland, 49%, uh, so almost half of it is coming from polyethylene. So single-use packaging, houseware, 
pipes, agricultural foils. And uh, so half of it is polyethylene. Then you have uh, um, you have a PET, PAT, from uh, clothing, polyethylene, um, um, and uh, it's uh, from uh, clothing. And then you have tire wear. These are uh, tire wear particles coming mostly from North America and from Asia that are coming up in Greenland because of the prevalent winds out there. But it's amazing that you are out there on the inland ice and you find that there is microplastics and especially there is tire wear. It's definitely not tire wear from Greenland that is coming out there and not even from Arctic Canada. It's coming from further south. <laughs> it has to in Greenland. The road, the road network in Greenland doesn't really exist, right? Well, it's, well, it's a very, it's, it's, it's very, it's a very small. There is, there is quite a lot of cars in Nuuk in in big cities. But, true, uh, big but cities compared to the size city, of the Nuuk, of the of the whole exactly. area, it's nothing. Yes. Yeah, exactly. We have like uh, sixty thousand inhabitants in Greenland, and uh, and there are not sixty thousand cars. <laughs> and no, that's uh, not even what you have in a in a in a smaller town in in Germany, for example. Yes. But when we go to uh, when we go to Antarctica, we don't find tire wear. We find mostly PE again, and uh, and uh, polypropylene. Uh, that's also quite uh, quite interesting, and uh, and then uh, PET. Uh, but uh, you don't find any tire wear uh, in there. Any tire wear microplastics. So it is it is quite interesting, but. Uh, uh even down in antarctica even with the antarctic circulation both in the air and in the seas where antarctica should be quite isolated from the rest of the globe well we find traces of things that have come from very far away and uh, i mentioned it before nanoplastics can be ingested by organisms and it can be then ingested by us <laughs> If we eat those organisms, uh, so what I find interesting, the microplastics. Yeah. What what I find interesting, Sorry. they have they have this uh, they have this measurement unit that what they call a snow fern cone or snow fern core, core. which is yeah. probably standardized in size, so they, you can compare it with others. And the well, the the uh, the the uh, the uh, density is in nanograms per milliliter. That's it the result of how, the, that's yeah. the so, amount of of microplastics they find in this snow yes. fern core. In the Arctic, is thirteen point two nanograms per milliliter, and in yeah, so the it's much more in Antarctica. Antarctic, <laughs> they find fifty two point four. So it's like uh, four times as much. Um, so so yeah. they fi they find less variety in plastics, but more plastics in Antarctic. Yes, and the difference is that uh, the uh, snow fern core is from the top of the inland ice, so it's only air transport, while the sea ice core has both the position from above and things transported by the sea. Ah, see? okay. Okay, so... So, so you have uh, a different different origin. But still, we were, we were talking about the Antarctic Convergence. When we are talking about the, the, all the currents, the winds, the westerlies, that are the, the roaring 40s and, <laughs> and the howling 60s that we have around Antarctica, 50s that we have around Antarctica, we still have a lot of things coming through. And these are not originating only from antarctic basis or tourism so the question things. the so, question now is um again in the arctic we find a bigger variety than in the antarctic um especially tire wear and polystyrene styrofoam missing in the antarctic from this yeah, core and that, and that, was, uh, that is well they uh, they were speculating here about styrofoam and uh, they were talking about uh, degradation that happens before uh, it reaches the nanoparticle. Uh, uh, how do you call mm. it? The the uh, the, the size. The, the nano the nanoplastic size uh, uh, size. Um, how do you call it? Uh, size uh, corn like uh, dimensions. So it's uh, well, it's quite. Uh, I would say it's it's quite interesting, and I actually think that this thing with with nanoplastics and in in general plastic pollution, it's uh, something that is. Uh, I wouldn't say emerging because it's emerged already quite. It's already uh, a here. While ago, it's, but, it's just uh, now that we're beginning to find here. out about it, right? 
Yeah, and uh, and nanoplastics we definitely don't see, but it still carries uh, a lot of other chemicals with it. It's not just the chemical that compose the nanoplastic. So it's not with when it's PE, it's not just polyethylene. There are also the uh, other chem- there can be also other chemicals that are used in the production that can be uh, changing or like they can be substituting hormones in our organisms yes. Yes. and therefore uh, changing our metabolism. And that is and, and not just ours, cannot, but the uh, uh, metabolism of the entire and uh, and environment yeah. there. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it is, um, it is quite, uh, quite a complex thing to study because uh, you do not know exactly where these things are coming from and how they are transported, but there is both atmospheric and marine transport, and there is maybe a re-emission. I mean, these, we do not know how old these particles are uh, because it's difficult to find out uh, from their chemical signatures. Uh, and um, it is uh, important to find, for example, if, uh, if we have main sources like focal sources of these are there are these coming from incineration plants for example uh the tire wear is coming from the roads or a place where tires are disposed of for the wear of the roads um so it's uh well there is more work to be done but uh interesting to see that uh when we even we see an, an environment as being pristine, maybe it's not that pristine. Okay, on to yes, penguins. Yeah, uh, I have uh, taken these two uh, penguin uh, penguin pieces. One is from Science, and uh, it's uh, a longer article. It's very nice uh, to read. It's uh, it's an idea like. Uh, a popular article from the journal scientific journal science and it's about a colony of uh, king penguins uh, on the Ile aux cochons which is a french territory in between madagascar and the uh, kerguelen island on the screen so it's in the subantarctic if we are talking about it yeah you have a map on the screen there and uh, it's a place that is very seldom visited because it has uh, an extremely high protection from interference from humans, so it has been uh, uh, it has been uh, let's say left by itself. Uh, and uh, in order to do field work there, I mean, you usually the the only way of getting there is by having a scientific project, and uh, and by uh, and by getting there by by ship because there is no landing place and it's too far away for a helicopter to to travel that far so you have to go by ship and this is um, a a data from an expedition that uh, was organized by the the French Polar Institute um, in 2017 where they noticed that the king penguin colony on Ile aux cochons, the Isle of Pigs is um, that was supposed to be about half a million breeding pairs that's uh yeah uh, you have the the king it's more or less in the middle of this picture of uh, the different uh, penguin uh, penguins of antarctica you have the emperor on the left very big and then the next biggest is the king penguin well these this colony went down by something like uh, uh what is it like uh, 90% so we in uh, when when the uh, when the researchers went down there and they were expecting to see this huge colony, well, they found only a few individuals. So they managed to go back in 2019 to uh, try to uh, implement some uh, some studies. So they put some satellite tags on the on the remaining on some of the remaining penguins and left them out uh, let them out to to see and see what they were doing and uh, study their cycle penguins come back to the same uh, the same colony year after year so uh, just uh, figuring out what kind of uh, what kind of travels they do and um, and they are still uh, working uh, and waiting for for the last penguins to uh, to give the data and to and uh, to analyze the results but it looks like the changes in the uh, in the position of the Antarctic convergence, so the current that uh, goes around Antarctica that separates the 
the northern temperate waters from the uh, southern ocean well that has gone further south so there is a larger distance for the penguins to reach the very productive area so probably they have moved uh, like the best of cases they have moved somewhere else so they have adopted a new colony uh, we do not know exactly where the worst case scenario is that they died off but, and um, we're not talking about like a, a couple of for the thousand Antarctic islands. We're not talking about a couple of thousand penguins here. We're talking about like <laughs> almost a million. No, uh, we're talking uh, about about a, uh, yeah, a million birds. Yes, that's uh, that's a lot of birds, wow. especially uh, they are big animals. But um, um, fortunately, the king penguins are not um, are not uh, endangered. Uh, the populations are doing quite okay um, right now, so uh, it's not too worrying but it is a signal that things are changing fast so a colony that has been used for hundreds if not thousands of years now it's uh now it's uh, practically empty now, and uh, talking about penguins yeah then we, can we have, we have one more article. about penguins yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's about gen 2 penguins and uh, the gen 2s are uh, like a pretty much the toughest penguins that you see around Antarctica. They are just about everywhere. But uh, they have uh, limitations. They are uh, uh, usually uh, at the like at the northern uh, ranges of the uh, of the uh, of the peninsula. And uh, here there is a, an expedition that was uh, on a Greenpeace ship that was going down to the Weddell Sea. And uh, they uh, have uh, been noticing that uh, now we see in the video out there is an Adeli penguin. So it's not Gen 2 here, but uh, they, are, they are showing different kinds of penguins. But uh, they uh, have been uh, noticing that the Gen 2 penguins have gone down further south than ever recorded. And, uh, and this means that uh, they have more access to southern, more southern locations. And southern locations, in this case, means closer to the pole, which means that the ice is opening up and letting them coming down there, uh, further south. When you look at the video, of course, just uh, be careful that uh, when they, even if it says Gen 2 penguins, I mean, in this case, for <laughs> example, it's a Gen 2 penguins, but sometimes there is a writing of Gen 2 penguin because of the title. is. But uh, it's uh, other species, especially Adelie penguins. Yeah. But the thing is, the thing so, is, uh, but gen gentle penguins are a bit like beavers. Apparently, they yeah. find a new, yeah, but a they, new way to get there but, and a new habitat, yeah. and then they move, or they are forced they move, to move. But they, but, they, but they don't, they don't build dams. They just build their nests. Penguin dams. And, uh, that's a that's rocks. a new thing. <laughs> Penguin right. nests. <laughs> yes, but uh, but it's quite it's quite interesting, and uh, yeah, they are opportunistic. Of course, they go where they can. They colonize new areas, and it's nice to see that the that there is a like a a reaction that the the penguins are not just staying there and the and the uh, and the uh, the colonies or the rookeries they become uh, they become too warm and then they uh, they begin to they they don't have enough of reproductive success they react and they go and they find a new place and uh, hopefully other species are also reacting well and uh, keeping up the good work All yeah right um, now but, let's uh, talk. We're down there, let, let's yeah. talk about an old friend of the show, which we have had as a guest here several times before, especially when when Henry was here, who's by the way still on a ship right now. So um, we are we are yeah. anxiously awaiting his return. But um, uh, we're talking about we an iceberg. We want him back. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about an iceberg, and of course, yeah. it's our good old friend A sixty eight. A, what's new about it's yeah. still around right it's still uh, on its way well it's like yeah uh, well, parts there of it. are <laughs> probably a few bits and pieces or parts of it uh, but uh, but uh, very small I mean he was uh, at the time where he uh, detached from the Larsen C shelf it was the biggest iceberg floating yes. and uh, like what is it like the ninth uh, or the sixth biggest ever iceberg recorded and it was like a more than 200 meters thick and uh, enormous and uh, he went towards south georgia and we followed it and then when he reached south georgia then he broke in many pieces and uh, and as he was so big uh, he went 
it, it was feared that they would uh, have a, a big effect on the South Georgia ecosystem. Now, um, we have both a, a link to uh, the article in um, on the uh, British Antarctic Survey website, and then uh, you can find uh, on the BBC there is also a little feature um, on on this article uh, with the root of the uh, of the iceberg. But what is really interesting is that uh, the people when when it broke out of South Georgia, it actually slowed down, and uh, it uh, that was in um, in uh, 2021, so uh, around uh, February 2021, and uh, it. Um, it melted. It was it, it broke into uh, many pieces, was right? Tabular iceberg. So it was yes, yes. But it was it was losing seven meters of its thickness every month. So it's like seven meters of ice melting over such a large area. That was the size of what they said. Because now I think on the BBC they're using they're using British uh, comparisons. They're using cricket the fields or Kent, something like that, or Kent and Wales, or <laughs> like cricket fields or something. But uh, it was. But it, it did actually. The uh, the best uh, comparison that I could find is uh, that uh, these uh, 152 billion tons of fresh water that melted from it is about the equivalent of 61 million Olympic swimming pools. Whoa! So it's quite a lot of water, and and these came out in a relatively short period around South Georgia. And when you modify, when you input a lot of fresh water into the into on on the sea, then you have a layering on top. Of course, there is a lot of storm, so there is a little bit of mixing, but you still have a lot of fresh water. So the salinity diminishes. There is an influence on the plankton, all the species that depend on the plankton, on the buoyancy. Just just by changing the buoyancy you have things that would float in seawater that actually go down because it's fresh water and uh, and that is uh, something that uh, has been estimated i mean this all these data have been estimated by using satellite data they've been uh, using uh, the at bass they were using the cryosat and uh, ice sat uh, satellites that measure altimetry so the uh, height of the surface uh, above uh, the geoid uh, so they uh, they could measure how much the iceberg had lost and as the iceberg melts then it also floats up a little bit more so it's a complex calculation it's not just measuring like how much went down because if it melted seven meters on the top you also moved up a little bit because it became lighter you know so it's uh it's it's a complex calculation, and this is why it took a little bit of time, but uh, but uh, they calculated this huge amount of fresh water that went into the sea around South Georgia, and uh, and now the um, the researchers also from Bass they've used gliders and they've used the core sampling of, of the sea bottom to see what happened, and uh, I think this we will keep coming back to the results of this maybe uh, one or two times more about uh, the actual consequences for life in the ocean around South Georgia. 152 of, billion tons of fresh water. It's crazy. And a ton is of course a thousand liters so it's like it's a, 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 a thousand like a thousand billion, like 152,000 billion tons of fresh water, billion liters, liters of, of fresh, fresh water. water. Yes. So it's just, it's, it's just uh, in, impossible to imagine. That's a lot of bottles. <laughs> All right. Um, and last yeah, but and, not uh, least. You can, really, you can really think about this. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Last but not least, and this is, I really wanted, I really wanted to have this uh, with the Arctic hair. Okay, the Arctic hare is a is an animal animals, in the Arctic. So what's going animals. on? Yes, yes. So Arctic hare. It's a small. I mean, it's quite a large hare. It's quite a large bunny, but it's uh, it's a tough little thing. I mean, it's being predated just, just about anybody, everybody out in the Arctic, from uh, like skuas to foxes and even polar bears, wolves, and others that might want to eat it. Well, Arctic hares, they uh, usually are quite sedentary. They have uh, small migrations. They move a little bit, but they don't move exactly that much. Researchers in Canada have gone to Ellesmere Island. They have put little tags on these animals, these fantastic tags that we always talk about, and, and they've been looking at where hares have moved. Do you remember the fox that went from Svalbard and was tracked 
on the sea ice and went to north of Greenland and then past Ellesmere Island and went over to Arctic Canada and had this fantastic epic journey. Uh, yeah, yes. Well, but Arctic yes, yes. hares, I mean, being, yeah, I mean, a polar fox, you think, well, he follows polar bears and he can move quite a lot, but Arctic hares are not exactly that. Well, this Arctic hare in 49 days, hopping along, went from the south of Ellesmere Island to a lake in the north. There's a nice oasis with a nice climate. So when the usually Arctic hares go and uh, and forage during the summer, and back again to where he started at the end of the season, for almost 400 kilometers in just over a month. That's quite a lot for just hopping about. I thought. <laughs> what makes an Arctic hare decide yeah. to go on such a long journey, or was it was it running after something, or was it running from something? I don't know. Maybe he thought it was late. <laughs> just a story <laughs> yes um hmm. <laughs> just uh, quoting lewis carroll there but that's an uh, interesting no, I, long, uh, long well, journey it's, it's 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 a very 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 uh long journey yeah like uh, you have like about a hundred a hundred kilometers that's normal uh, 300 maybe just if you are not but uh on the same period, but uh, like all the other hares, they were jump, jumping about. But this is like 400 kilometers, just a lot of distance. In and that's, uh, but that's just one single yeah. single hare they tracked yeah. with a tracking device. So, yeah. um, doesn't yeah, now mean, we're talking about a, that yeah. doesn't mean an entire population is moving somewhere else because of no. uh, whatever no, no, melting. No, no, there is not an invasion. Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, it's not watership down. No, no okay, <laughs> hmm. no, of course. But that's that was quite uh, quite interesting. Yeah. All right. So, and, uh, yeah. Okay. That well, concludes this, this episode of Curiously Polar. We've been talking about Russian maneuvers, beavers, um, sea ice, nanoplastics, penguins, icebergs, and the Arctic hare. That's another newsreel in the can. Thank you, Mario, for being here. And thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll be back soon with another newsreel and maybe and a longer topic. Everybody. Let's figure this out. All right. Until then, everyone, take care. And, and hopefully Henry. One. Yes, and hopefully with Henry. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>